amazingly, the church looks that is sorry for preaching the gospel to the world. Many people are going outside and asking for forgiveness for being Christian and saying, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. I'm sorry, I believe in God. I'm sorry that we proclaim the gospel. Many issues are going on these days on the news and people are feeling that we are, in some way or another, intolerant. We are intolerant to a world that is better than us, a world that have a broader mind, a more intellectual mind, a more uh, mature mind than us. Because we cannot accept other people's belief, because we cannot accept to coexist with other people's uh, affections or inclinations of life. And it seems like the church is sorry for many other issues that are going on these days on the world. The church is sorry for proclaiming that there is life and the conception of a baby. And people are saying sorry because we say that God created only a man and a woman. And we try to reconcile with the world instead to try to all Christians make the world reconcile with God. It seems that the, the gospel have ten, has a tendency to go in a different way. Are we today sorry for what we believe in front of our relatives, in front of our friends, in front of our co-workers or classmates? Why? What is this kind of shyness that we have in, in this generation in church today? People, are, of course, they say that we are living a global area. We are living the globalization influence of the world. And we have to accept each other. We have to coexist with one another. And we have many kinds of religion that they all look that they are true in their ways and in their teaching. And even non-religious groups like science, they also have different opinions and we have to coexist as accepting all kinds of ideas or ideologies because that's part of our world today. And if we are intolerant of these kinds of perspective, then the people cannot tolerate us anymore. We have to go back again to the beginning of the church when on the day of Pentecost day the church received the DNA of the Holy Spirit and DNA have the power to testify to the end of the earth. That's the promise of Jesus. What we testify? We testify what God has done for us, what God has promised for us and what God has done in the time that he was on planet earth. In other words, we have to share the gospel. What is the gospel? By definition, we know the gospel is the good news. What is the good news? What kind of good news are we sharing to this world? But people, they don't see when we share the gospel, that's a good news for them. They feel they are persecuted or we are just showing to them bad news. Pointing to them that they are sinners and they need to repent. Perhaps the church have made a mistake to know presented the gospel in a way that people can receive the gospel and open their hearts to the Lord and confess their sins in a way that they could understand God's will for their life. Many people, they just present an angry, all-fashioned God who wants to send his army to destroy people. They present a, a Jesus that is intolerant, exclusive in his message, and, they don't, and he doesn't have any other space for other ideas or culture or anything. What is the gospel? What is the good news? And why we feel sorry for preaching the gospel? Let me ask you this question personally. What are you going to do without the gospel? What kind of life you can live without the gospel? What is the good news for you? When do you receive this good news? In other words, if we don't understand that we are living by grace, under the grace of God every day, we are not living the gospel every day. We are not living the life that God brought us to live. I mean... Whatever we do here in this world, whatever we become in this world, it's not, our, it's not for our glory. It's not for us. We are not here because we randomly or casually we were born. God planted our birth. God planted our life. And he gave us, with his plan, also the liberty, the free will to choose, glorify his name or deny his spirit in us. We have a gospel that is a symbol of our debt to God for saving us, for having us in his holy presence, and for 
giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do we have the gospel in our life today? Are we grateful for this good news? Are we are devoted to pay back the price of this gospel, the price of this good news, that God came from the world, that God came to the world to save us and to take us back to heaven? So, what is the gospel? The gospel is historical. It's historical because it's the undeniable fact of history, even in no biblical resources. Like in the book of Josephus and Tacitus, who were no Christians, they recorded about the history of the gospel. The gospel is also scriptural. The good news is about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that was predicted, foretold, and prophesied in the Old Testament. The gospel is theological because it addresses the offensive nature of men's sins toward a holy God. The gospel is Christological because it's about Jesus. He died. He was buried. He was raised. He appeared again. And he promised to come back for us, for his church. The gospel is personal too. Jesus died for our sins. We agree with that. But this sacrifice must be taken personal in an appropriate way. The Apostle Paul would say to the first of Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, I preach to you, which you also receive, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. We have to take this word you as a personal address. That God, this gospel is for me and only for me. That this love of God is for me and only for me. And I'm the only person that needs to receive forgiveness of God because I'm a sinner in front of God. Only I and I have sinned against God. That's the confession of faith that we need to have every day in front of the presence of the Holy God. The gospel is missional because we are under a direct order and commandment from the head of the church, that is Jesus Christ, to share the gospel to every created being, March 16, 15. So what are we doing with the gospel? When we go to heaven, according to Rick Warren in his book, Purpose Living Life, God will ask us only one question in heaven. When you were in earth, what you have done with my son? What you have done with my son? In other words, while we are here in, in planet Earth, what we have done, what we are doing with the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that he came from heaven to earth. He lived a holy life. He died and forgave our sins. He resurrected on the third day. He, wrote, he ascended into heaven and he promised to come back for his church, Maranatha. That is the gospel. That's the good news. And because we believe that, that we were creating in him, we have been forgiven by his sacrifice. We resurrected with Christ as we baptized and we know that we have a new life and he is interceding for us in heaven. We wait on his second coming to take his church in a wedding ceremony that the whole world will see when we will spend eternity with Jesus forever. That is the gospel. That's our hope. That is our faith. And that's the reason that we must live as Christians. What is the reason for living? What is the purpose for your life? What is the reason that you are studying hard, making good business and having a beautiful family? What is the purpose of that? To live just a cycle of life like animals live in this world or to glorify God's name by bringing more people into the kingdom of heaven. God wants to use your study. God wants to use your talent. God wants to use your personality. He wants to use your business. He wants to use your family members to bring more people to his family, to adopt more children in the name of Jesus. But this gospel is uncomfortable today for the world. Probably we don't think about the methodology, how we present the gospel. We just think about the content. And we try to bring this good news to people that they don't receive it as a good news. They receive it as bad news. And the people are tired of bad news every day that you just turn on the TV every, every day. And the only thing that you hear are only bad news. How many good news you listen or watch on the news every day? And how many bad news you listen or watch on the news every day? You will find that only 5% of the news every day are good news. And the rest of the news, 95% are only bad news. So people are tired of bad news. And if you present the gospel as a bad news for them, then they won't receive the gospel by grace and with faith. They feel that you will condemn the world instead to giving a hope, to giving faith and love, as we said the last week. People are expecting something, to live a better life, to live a, a life that they can leave all the burdens to someone who can carry them in their arms. But they don't find that loving Father. They don't find a loving Jesus 
in the way we present the gospel. We are more religious, that we just hurry to enter into the temple courts. We do our rituals every week, but we don't have mercy and compassion for a world who cannot walk with God, as this crippled man who was every day in the door of the temple, the beautiful. Today, people are uncomfortable with the gospel, as it was in the time of the apostles. If we back to the scripture today in Acts chapter 4, let's see again verse 1 and 2, and it says that the priests, the captains, the Sadducees, all the leaders of Jerusalem, when they heard Paul and, sorry, Peter and John preaching and speaking to the people, they get jealous. They were disturbed because they were teaching in the name of Jesus. And they were teaching about the resurrection of Jesus. The first sermon that the church preached was not the prosperity gospel. The first sermon that the, priest, the, the, the church preached was not a healing gospel. No, it was a gospel of motivating people or leaping up people's emotions. It was about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm here today in July, first Sunday of 2018, to preaching about the resurrection. I know it's not Easter Sunday today, but this is what we must preach every Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive, and we are serving a living God. We are not serving a religious God that is up in heaven and far, far away from all of us in living in a far, far away kingdom. That's what fantasy and foretellings of kids tell to our generation and any generation. We are living a generation, or we must live a generation of Christians who have brought the kingdom of heaven near to everybody, and we are worshiping and living with our king who is alive, who was dead, but he rose again from the dead. Our God is not dead. Our God is alive. And that's the power that the church needs today to testify to the end of the world. But most of the people, when they see the church members and they see the church, they think God is dead. Actually, there are two movies about this and two books. God is dead, number one. God is dead, number two. I recommend you to read these two books. I'm actually having a personal study with these books. And watch these two movies and think about what is your role in this generation to defend the faith that God is not dead. These leaders of Jerusalem, they were uncomfortable with this couple. Jesus died? Yeah, they know that. They know that they killed Jesus. God forgive their sins if they confess their sins. But they never repented for their sins. And now when they hear this gospel from the lips of Peter, they were all disturbed. They feel now the guilty of their sins. And they wanted to stop the apostles to preach about the resurrection of Jesus. But this gospel not only is uncomfortable, this gospel is powerful. The gospel has power. Verse 7 said that they have Peter and John brought before them and began to question but what power or what name did you do this? They perform a miracle. And they even preach. With what authority? With what power? With what name? They did that. Well, Jesus replied to this question. In verse 10, he said, Then know this, you and all people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stand before you heal it. In other words, it is in the name of Jesus that you see this miracle. And it's in the name of Jesus that we are preaching and receive this power and authority to tell that, that God is alive, He's not dead, and He's living in us, and whoever believes in Him can see a miracle and change in his life or her life. This gospel is uncomfortable for this generation, as it was in the first century. This gospel still has power in this generation, as it has power in the first century. But this, this gospel is still exclusive in this generation as it was in the first century. The exclusivity of the gospel is presented by Peter here in verse 11 and 12. But he said, He is Jesus Christ, the stone you builders rejected, which has been to the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Do you notice the exclusivity of the gospel? We no negotiate the truth of the good news. We can negotiate the way we present the gospel. We have many different kinds of worship these days. We have open service. We have traditional services. We have new songs. We have hymns. It's okay. Some people wear suit, necktie when they preach. You go to Hawaii and people worship God in short. That's okay. The presentation of the gospel has to be contextualized according to the culture. But the content of the gospel will be the same. We are under the grace and we are preaching grace only. 
And we present grace not as a noun, but as a subject, a person. Because grace is spelled Jesus. Grace is spelled Jesus. Galatians chapter 1 verse 8 said, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternal condemned. We have no authority, no power to preach any other gospel except the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are only preaching about his name, not any other name. We are not preaching about Mary, what Mary had done, what Mary suffered, what Mary uh, said to the church. We are not preaching about what Paul or Peter or John said to the early church. We are not preaching about any prophet of the Old Testament. We are only preaching about Jesus and in his name and what he has done and what he has promised for his church until he came back. We have only one way, one name, and one life in Jesus. Jesus says in John chapter 14, says, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the life. No one's come to the Father except through me. But this gospel is uncomfortable for the people today. Who wants to be Christian? I said other religions, Muslim, Jews, Mormons, Krishnas, Hindus, Buddhists. In this new age generation, people say, if we Christians try to be exclusive, we won't be accepting in society. These same people who deny the gospel, these days in the news, they try to use the, the words to, to fight against us. Issues like immigration here in, in, in USA these days are now raising their voices against a government using the Bible. I don't know, I'm not here to talk who make a mistake or who misinterpreted the Bible, but the point is that people who always deny the Bible now are using the Bible to fight back to Christians or what Christians believe. It's a paradox, paradoxical that people who deny that, that God exists and the exclusivity of the gospel, they try to use the gospel today to arrange a political issue. Always. The gospel tried to be politicized in history. But we are not preaching the political gospel. We are not preaching the prosperity gospel. We are not preaching the healing gospel. We are not preaching the fellowship gospel. We are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, resurrected from the dead, ascended into heaven. He's interceding with us, and he will come back on the day that he will judge the living and the dead. What are we going to do now? We have to prepare to share the gospel. This book of Acts is started by a command. A command to wait until we receive the power to preach the gospel to the end of the world. We must preach the gospel to all creatures, to all people in this world, to all nations, in all languages, as Peter did. Peter started his first two sermons preaching about the resurrected Jesus. He preached the gospel, and this gospel was uncomfortable to the leaders of the Jews. In his first and second sermon, Peter in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 3, he told the, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. This gospel was prophesied, and this prophecy was fulfilled. In Jesus' life, these prophecies came from the Old Testament. And now, in Jesus' life, this promise of God, these prophecies, this gospel is fulfilled. According to the gospel of Peter, Jesus is God. His miracles prove that he is God. Also, Peter said that Jesus died on the cross. And he raised from the dead by the power of God. God raised Jesus back to life, says Peter in chapter 2 and chapter 3 again. God gave us gladness and joy and hope through this gospel. In chapter 2, he also said that God sent his spirit from heaven, the promise of God. And we have now the Holy Spirit who is helping us to share this gospel. We must repent. We must be baptized. As Peter said, it's, it's important, it's the first step of faith. If we want to conquer the world and be winners in this life by faith, we must first repent, turn back to God, change the way we are living and live for his glory and be baptized. In other words, to proclaim in public without any shame, that we are followers of Jesus. We will also be given the Holy Spirit, and we will live a different life from the world, and again, in some way opposite of the, the world. What makes you different from the rest of the world? How can you live, show to the world a different style of life that the people will see you, the need of the gospel? We are not here to condemn the world, but we are here to show the world the light. We are here to show the world that if we remain in Jesus faithfully, we can contend evil in our life. We can put a limit and say, evil, you came this far in my life as the soul of the earth. Who pre prevent corruption, who prevent contamination. But we as a light of the world also have to show good deeds. As much as we know God's word, show the good deeds. Not just faith, but love too. Then people will see with hope that in us, in church, we have an opportunity, an open door for people to receive this gospel, this good news that is the life eternal. How can we do that? How can we be ready to share the gospel? What do we need as Christians? It's very simple. 
you just need to spend that your time with the gospel. Spend time with Jesus. That's all that you need to do in prayer and listen to his word. Verse 13 says that when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were, and it's called it, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note. They took note that these men, these ordinary, and it's called it men, they have been with Jesus. You don't need to go to a seminar to have a study of theology to become a witness of Jesus. Your witness comes from your daily time with God. Your daily time in prayer. Your daily time in meditating on God's word. First for yourself. To have in yourself an assurance of salvation from this gospel. And second to affirm your, your faith so you can stand firm, stand out, and stand out for Jesus. To share these words with the gospel of peace in a peaceful way to those who ask you for a reason of your hope. First Peter chapter 3 verse 15. Are we ready to share this gospel? Or are we ashamed and sorry for this gospel? Paul says in Romans chapter 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first to the Jews and then to, for the Gentiles. Are we ashamed of the gospel? Are we ashamed to share what we believe? Are we hiding ourselves, our light, under the bed, under the table that nobody can see? Or are we putting our light on the top that people can see? Transparency, integrity. That's what we need today. That's the kind of church people are looking for. When John the Baptist, he was arrested for being tolerant, for presenting a gospel, the gospel of the Old Testament, to the Jews. The leaders of Israel and the king of the, Jew, the Israelites, the Jews, arrest John the Baptist for his boldness to condemn the king's sin and say, because in that time, Herod the king, he had committed adultery with a bro uh, brother's wife, Herodias, and now they are living in adultery. And John the Baptist directly point out the sin of the king. This king, he didn't care about the preaching of John the Baptist. Oh, he's just another preacher. Well, let him talk. But his wife, Herodias, she was offended because she knew she was a sinner. It was in her mind that she couldn't have this peace and enjoy her kingdom because there's always someone who was preaching about holiness. And she was disturbed about that. And she wanted to kill John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was in prison. But while he was in prison, Jesus started his ministry. And he is Start to preaching Capernaum, healing, preaching the gospel, and serving the word and proclaiming the kingdom of God was near. Then John the Baptist, he knew that his time was close. That probably he won't go out of jail this time, like other times. He won't escape from the wrath of the people of Israel and the king of the Jews. So, in his mind, in his humanity, he knew that Jesus, when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came and the voice of God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am pleased. He saw the Holy Spirit. He heard the voice of God. It was an amazing event in his life. But he's now in prison and the kingdom of God is now established. So he sent his disciple to Jesus and said, are you the one that we are waiting for or we must wait for another one? This same question come to our church today. There are people outside that is asking, are you the real church or we are waiting for another one? Do we must wait for the next church or this is the church that we were waiting for? Is this the real gospel or we have to wait for another gospel? This same question people are asking outside. Jesus replied to the disciple of John the Baptist and said, Tell to John what you have seen and heard. Miracles are happening. People are resurrected from the dead. The poor have received the gospel, and now the kingdom of God is established. What Jesus was telling is not, yes, I'm the one. Yes, we are the church. Yes, we are preaching the gospel. But he said, look what we have done. See what we have done. Tell to John what we are doing. Tell to John what you see that we are doing. And of course, we know the rest story. John was the capitate. And Jesus' ministry have hit again. We need to think about what will be the rest of our life this year, 2018. Today is the first Sunday of July, and we have six months ahead for this year. How are we going to glorify God's name the rest of this year, the rest of our life? Are we are the child of God, the son of God, the daughter of God, that people are waiting in our company, in our study, in our, in our schools, in our neighborhood, or they have to wait for another Christian who will introduce to them the gospel? Are we the one that God has anointed every Sunday with his Holy Spirit to preach the good news to the poor, to serve those who are in need, 
and to resurrect the dreams and hopes of people who were dead, spiritually, taken by their hands with faith and love, and walk together into the presence of God to walk with God forever? Is this the gospel that we have today to share to this world? What will be the heralds of tomorrow? What will be the news for tomorrow? We must come out of church today making news that we have the gospel, we have the good news to tell the world that today and tomorrow outside of church are waiting to her. That now we have the gospel. This is the real gospel. That Jesus is with us. That Jesus has saved us. That Jesus has offered to all of us who repent and turn back to him an eternal life. He will come back. He will be back. We need to present this gospel. We need to share this news. Become names of heralds. Good news for the world who always have bad news. So let's pray this morning. And let's ask to the Holy Spirit again to anoint us. To tell the world the good news of the gospel. In Jesus' name. Let's pray.